Um, wait, I didn't see a Hi. guest. Testing. I'm, I'm bringing him on. Okay. So I see you recording up there. So all I got to do is hit record and we're ready to go. You ready, Freddie? We are. Okay. All this That's shit exactly who's coming. <laughs> okay, wait, I, I, I got to get some stuff off my screen. All right, here we go. Okay, honey. And, and a five, you. six, five, four, three, two, one. And now you're live. Welcome to the Outer Realm. Sorry for the delay, everybody. Uh, we are broadcasting live here on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM and 105.3 FM from New Orleans. Having a little bit of trouble in New Orleans tonight, but bear with us and uh, we'll we'll get through it together. Uh, this evening's segment is partially sponsored by Folgers Coffee, so thank you, Folgers. We love you. Uh, please stop on by the YouTube page and to get into chat, and you'll be able to communicate with us. And tonight's guest is Freddie Silva, amazing Freddie Silva. We'll be discussing the lost art of resurrection, and you will not realize just how wrong we've got it. So settle in, hopefully with a couple of Folgers, and we are going to bring Freddie on board and... Let me see now. Here we go. Where we go. Bear with us. We're doing this the old-fashioned way. So add and there. Calling, calling. Mm -hmm. And here is the man himself. Thank God. <laughs> it's like, what is so, going on? <laughs> you're having problems. Studio's having problems. I'm like, come on. Every okay, time I try to bring you on the show, there's a hurricane or something's going on. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> it is because you just know stuff that the rest of us aren't supposed to know. <laughs> so, and we're dying to know. Shamala. Yes. Yeah, like I'm like, come on, not again. Oh, not God. again. <laughs> this is why I drink heavily. Have some time to I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. start. <laughs> I know I'm there. That would have been me if, if, if everything would have buggered up tonight. <laughs> in, in a fetal position in the corner with a glass of wine. Oh, um, uh, but uh, so yeah, I, was, I once dared to suggest during a George Nuri interview that you know, to lighten things up, that uh, we have a drinks cabinet and a fireplace and some smoking jackets. And uh, oh. he actually laughed. I got, I won a dollar. So I can bet I can make him laugh live. And I did. It's like, you know, it actually sounds like a really good idea. We sit here with, you know, well, uh, uh, cognac tumblers and uh, have a lovely discussion that make it much more interesting. <laughs> you know well, what's missing is the dark chocolate mm. with that oh, cognac. I hate that. Yeah, sorry, it's all gone. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's missing. You can't have cognac without dark chocolate. You can have and it has cognac to be from, anytime. It has anytime. to be from Belgium. <laughs> it has to be from Belgium, the dark chocolate. Well, yeah, there are others. <laughs> there is a nice landing chocolate, which is where well, you can't just eat the whole bar. You've got to eat both of them at the same time. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I can. I think so, I can. <laughs> and then there's that intense orange by Lind, which is pretty good. Uh, that's funny. The best honestly. chocolate in the world is actually in New Zealand. It's a hazelnut uh, uh, milk chocolate. And, uh, my God, it's packed with whole hazelnuts. There's so many of them oh. that... You got to carry the chocolate bar with two hands. It's, it's uh -huh. almost like the Italian janduja. Yeah. It's really nice. It's oh great. no, we're gonna start talking food, and I haven't eaten. That's not even sorry. fair. I I don't have wine or anything. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, you have one for me. Whatever it is you have, have some extra. <laughs> And the same thing we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, let's see what you're like in an hour. Be Freddie. Freddie, hang on the floor. Are you okay? <laughs> it all depends if he refills or not. <laughs> we'll know from there. We'll know how well we're doing if he has to go for a refill. Uh, the trick is it's to, you have to, it, it's, it's about lubricating the machinery. The trick is not to over oil it. <laughs> that oil. could go so many ways. Okay. It could, yeah. That's a whole other show, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and R rated, I think, maybe. Um, <laughs> it was written to a book that I never wrote, which is called uh, uh, Str uh, uh, Strange Bites in Weird Places. And it's not about what you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how our mind just automatically go there, though. <laughs> well, I didn't. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> I don't know. That could be an interesting show, too, I have to say. Um, 
But I am really thrilled that you're back, and, and I'm sorry that you were having issues. I guess it could have been a close call either way. Um, so tonight, The Lost Art of Resurrection. And I have to say, honestly, it leaves me with even more questions than, than what I started with. Exactly. That's the whole point. Well, that's good. Okay, so I'm on track. <laughs> so... Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, the whole point was to sort of look at something, the practice that was being carried out, um, I thought, in uh, the, around the Mediterranean in recent times. It turns out it can trace, be traced all the way back to 8000 BC. And I just got thinking about it. I, I got fascinated by what would it take for people in the old days to do what we're doing now, which is to seek uh, enlightenment. And, uh, you know, today we sort of, People are doing ayahuasca as the latest trendy thing to do, or some mm. Pedro, which I believe is much more gentle from what I'm told, from mm. what I'm told. Um, and, um, but back in the day, people were spending up to three years learning this technique, which essentially involved uh, um, a near-death experience. It was an induced near-death experience, and people went back again and again for it, uh, which is extraordinary. So it took you three years to learn the method by which to leave the body and then actually have a real experience, unlike shamanism or unlike a drug-invested uh, experience, have a real experience in the other world, you know, as, as real as you and I are talking on, uh, on the computer right now. And uh, that's what amazed me about the whole project was to find out who was doing this uh, and how much of it was going on around the world. Wow. So... <laughs> I, it's it's mind blowing to think that you could spend three years on something, so there's yeah. a lot of preparation, and it must really be something if you want to do it again. <laughs> like just just yeah, Py Pythagoras did it set, uh, five times. Uh, Plato did it twice, and it said it shaped my whole metaphysical doctrine. Uh, so it was it was really the foundation of his metaphysical uh, ideas and how he evolved those into his philosophy. That so. Uh, you know, that we know and love so much today. So it really was a kind of an experience. And it's like, I just came back from Egypt uh, mm. for the third time during the pandemic. It seems to be the only place where you can go and actually have a great time because uh, there's nobody there. So uh, the people who are on my, my trips are more than happy and delirious, and, uh, totally enlightened now, uh, because we actually got to go into one of these uh, chambers where they did practice this out-of-body experience called the living resurrection it was in the valley of the kings which we wow. all seem to think that it was all to do with dead people yes uh, people are buried in the valley of the kings but there's one chamber I will, i'll not call it a tomb there's one chamber which doesn't fit because mm -hmm. the guy for whom it was built he is buried on the other side of the hill in hatshepsut's temple so why does one guy need two places of rest i wonder uh, and then it's the fact that the chamber is completely misaligned uh, to the cardinal points. I mean, if you're going to go to the other world, you want to go into the west uh, or have your head in the east for, for, for rising. Uh, this points to the northeast, which is a position of wisdom. You go to the northeast to access information. Well, if you're already dead, you already have the information. You don't need to go there. You already are there. Right. Uh, and, uh, so when they found this chamber right at the very head of the Valley of the Kings, and we were the first people in years to have access to this. Uh, I believe I'm making a lot of friends over in Egypt because I've been there so many times now. And they, they, they've been watching me, the guards. And they think, this guy this guy's knows what he's doing. And it's all, he's, he's honoring the culture. And the people that come with him, they, they're very respectful. So you, get, you build up a little bit of a cash uh, mm -hmm. with these people. And second time, we just came back and did it again. And on the walls of the chamber, there are 457 deities, each of whom has a specific teaching that you have to memorize before you can leave your body, because leaving is easy. I've done that. Anybody can do that. The problem mm. is coming back, because mm. it's so much fun over there, uh, and you're having such a great time, and it's so different from what uh, you're used to in a waking world that you get distracted. And before you know it, a lot of time has passed, and you realize I haven't come back into my body, and basically, you're dead in the third dimension. Uh, and people do this in the Great Pyramid all the time. They think that just by lying in the big box for a whole night, um, they can leave the body and go travel in uh, outer space. Yeah, you can. Uh, it takes you a couple of, it takes you about 20 seconds to leave. 
the problem is you, you don't know how to get back. And the, uh, often, more often than not, there's a, the Egyptians opened the gates to the Great Pyramid and there's a dead guy lying inside that box. So you've got to be very careful with this stuff. And uh, that's why the three-year preparation was essential. And part of the training was controlling emotion and also fear. You cannot oh, fear. take fear with you. You take fear with you, you're lost. You're completely lost. So this is the extent and the degree to which they went to have this incredible, uh, I don't want to say religious, I say spiritual experience, which really opened their eyes to a new reality. And you confronted life when you came back into the body, totally in control. You're in control of fear. You control your environment. Mm -hmm. And if you came back with the laws of nature, you could harness the laws of nature. And you, could, you it gave you a certain degree of control over your ability to manifest around you. Uh, and I can say, yes, I've actually tried this, and it's actually very interesting, and uh, it does work. And the How long were you down for? Um, I went, I think I was out for about 40 minutes. Uh, wow. It was actually, wow. it actually happened to me in a crop circle, and I wasn't even expecting this. Uh, and I was taken out of body. The next time I saw the people that I was involved with in the other world was years later, when I was getting more involved with sacred sites. I saw the same people coming out of the walls of the Great uh, uh, of the King's Chamber and the Great Pyramid, and I have witnesses to prove this. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I've been there, and it's wonderful. And uh, no, they won't let me go back there because they know I, I'm enjoying it way too much, and I got work to do. They just sent me back <laughs> so I could write about it and teach about it. I mean, that's my purpose here is to uh, you know to show others a much more finer way of controlling your uh, um, your conscious manifestation, and also mm -hmm. go through. I understanding how temples work. So that's my purpose. And I guess I'm very uh, protected by a certain people around me who obviously know that I'm a very curious person, but you can stick your nose in the honey pot a little bit too deep, uh, which is what I like to do. And then you don't know how to get back. So I'm very, I'm very protected in that respect. I'm very lucky. So I've been there, done that, and uh, I can write about it. I think it's fantastic. Um, Definitely, like, you know, don't go, okay, kids, listen, don't everybody start jumping into the DMT, okay? Because uh, it's exactly. not the same thing. <laughs> what is it What is it like for you when you come back from that um, it's experience? It's really um, depressing um, because it's so uh -huh. wonderful over there. That wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, it was exciting. <laughs> but uh, but uh, there's a two-part uh, answer to this. One is the fact that... Um, but, uh, you are essentially. Are you being called? No, <laughs> I just had my volume up because I am a this bozo. Is live, people. <laughs> um, you, it's it's a very different environment. And there's no fear. That, well, actually, if you're in control of fear, you don't feel fear. It's the fact there's no pain, and you're always sur uh, surrounded by this unconditional love. And I'm not the first person to say this. Many people have had this even in an induced, uh, not in uninduced near death experience, involuntary near death experience. And um, it's very much like that. And when you're in that kind of space, the real world is very disappointing because it hurts, you know. I mean, but that's the whole point. Yeah. You come here to learn. Uh, but the other point is that I cannot mention what I saw because there's a, a, an oath of silence and everyone took this. Because the idea is it's a personal journey. If I was to tell you about my experience, it would color your expectation if you were to try it. And the same thing happened in Greece two and a half thousand years ago. So let's say I was sitting in Tibetan somewhere and Spiros was having a, a metaxa with me. And he'd say, hey, Freddy, uh, what are we doing for the weekend? And I'd say, hey, guess what I've been? And I'd be thrown in jail because, and they were serious about this, I would be put in jail uh, because, not because I was giving away some big secret, I would be telling someone else about my experience and it would basically prejudice their own experience uh, because you, your life is different from mine. Your experience is different yeah. from mine. <laughs> your life is something completely different. So for me to tell you, describe what was going on, would really um, almost be disappointing for you when you had your experience because yours would be so, so much different. So that's why I don't really talk about it because that's what everybody else did, did as well. But I can say it's very... Um, liberating, it certainly does help you take control of your life and mm -hmm. you do see people build a much clearer vision. So it's a process of gradual building the, the spiritual self, but also taking control and taking responsibility of who you are, which means you have a degree of control over what happens in your life, and that's what we're all looking for. So that's why I feel this, this information is very important, because you do develop a certain sense of control. 
So the ancients pretty much had it right, and we've had it wrong this whole time about resurrection. Oh, come we on, let's, let's, let's go there. <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> okay, JC. The difference, Michelle, it's the fact that we're looking for this high with the uh, ayahuasca and everything, and the, the shamans yes. that I've talked to said, that's just weekend shamanism. You know, th these are instant Indians, as they call it. Uh, yeah. That's not what it's yeah. about. That's just yeah. a simulation. The drug is a simulation. You're not having a simulation. Your mm -hmm. soul has left the body, and you're now in the other world. It's very real. And mm -hmm. The drug taking is kind of a, a a vehicle to get you there, but to do it properly, you're going to give up at least six months of your life, go into the jungle, meet the right people, and uh, be prepared for some hard truths. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were not smiling when they said this. It's, it's just really hard work. Uh, mm -hmm. But once you do it, it becomes second nature. Uh, you can leave uh, at will. Uh, and uh, you're in complete control of the natural laws, and you can mm -hmm. bend to a certain degree, which, of course, is also very dangerous, paradoxically, because you start developing a bit of an ego. And that's mm -hmm. why it really helps to have people around you who can just say, look in the mirror, because you're getting this a little bit too out of control. And it is. It's a real drug in a real mm -hmm. sense where it takes you over. So, uh, And again, luckily, I've found people who do pull me aside and say, uh, are you sure you're going in the right direction here? And I'll go, actually, maybe I'm not. I'm getting a little bit woolly here. Uh, let's get back to the center. Let's get grounded a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Drink one, have sushi. Uh, yes. Do you need an intervention, Freddie? Uh, exactly. <laughs> That's what friends are for, to give you an intervention. Okay, you have to stop leaving the body. <laughs> so it's not good for you to do it as much as you want to do it. Um, so this goes back to really ancient times. We're talking times of the Essenes. Like, I mean, predates the Essenes. Um, there's only one person that essentially history tells you had an actual resurrection. I wonder who that is. I don't know, but all the hate mail is going to go to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have been Yosef, the son of Yosef. Yeah, no, Jesus' story is actually very uh, enlightening. And in fact, when I was researching the material for the last art of resurrection, that was the question I asked because the information that we have really comes from the Catholic Church and it's completely bogus. And I'm not speaking as a personal opinion. I'm speaking from the point, uh, reiterating what the early Christians were saying. These are the Gnostics. These are the people whose books were completely removed from the canon of the Bible because their stuff is very enlightening. And God is suddenly not out there, God is in here. Uh, but when you see the language of the Essenes and other groups like the Mandeans uh, in that particular part of the world at the time, you get a sense of what was really going on because the church hated all of them. Uh, they basically killed every single one of them in order to cut the ties to make sure that people did know where they had plagiarized the story from, but they cut out the really good bits. Because the idea was that uh, the story of Jesus as a God did not wash, uh, sorry, Jesus as the man did not wash with people of the Roman world, mm. which is back then in the Mediterranean was just about everybody, uh, because they were used to deifying people as heroes. They had to be made to God. So the story that the um, Gnostics were portraying had Jesus as an ordinary guy who was an initiate like countless others before him who achieved something great and said, look, I can do this, and so can you, because I'm just a normal guy. So that was the message. It wasn't a, supposed to be a religion. Well, that wasn't going to work for the uh, the Catholics and also for the fundamentalists, or for the Romans, for that matter. So they had to make him into a god. So that was easy. They just badgered Constantine, the Roman emperor, and he had been practicing for many, many years the cult of Mithra, who was a cult that goes back to at least 6,500 BC in the Indus Valley. <laughs> And the cult essentially is this. Uh, there is a, uh, a man, an ordinary man, who starts off on his wonderful meditation to leave the body and go traveling in the other world uh, on the spring equinox. And exactly nine months later, on the uh, winter solstice, takes a drug, goes into the other world for three days, comes back, is declared risen from the dead, and is therefore afterwards de deified as a god. Sound familiar? And mm -hmm. all the Constantine did after being badgered for so long by these uh, guys wearing you know, red robes and little red shoes was, look, I'm dying. Leave me alone. Just take out the word Mithra and put the word Jesus in there. You have an instant religion. And that's what we've been fed. 
But if you know the story and if you know the words that Jesus was saying and the uh, mechanism and the metaphors that he was employing, it's very easy to unravel the story because, first of all, he says, I am the way. Well, he's given away exactly the teaching that he was prescribing to because the Essenes were the followers of the way and the Mandeans were the followers of the way. Now, mm. it took me a while to figure out what this, what this way was all about. And it was all to do with 17 teachings. And I finally worked out that these teachings go back to Persia, about 2000 BC, and eventually they make their way to China and before that to Japan. And it was a book called the Kujiki 72, and it's dated roughly around 8000 BC. We don't really quite know for sure. And it's called. It also comes under the teachings of the Way of Ise, which is basically the Way of Isis. Now, what mm -hmm. is Isis doing in Japan? And, and <clears throat> Another story, but essentially, uh, the uh, this teaching became known as the Taiyi, which is translated as the way. So this teaching moves eight thousand years from the east all the way through Indochina, all the way through India, and it ends up in the Middle East and in the Near East, and that's what Jesus was practicing. So if you strip all this um, the religion away, uh, Jesus was just saying, "I'm an ordinary guy. I'm following a very old tradition, which, by the way." The Egyptians were also practicing at the Osiria at Abydos within mm. 17 attendant chambers. You'd learn a teaching in each one of those chambers. So that's why the story is very important. But in order to understand its truth, you really have to look at the uh, Gnostic Gospels, of which we now have much evidence that we can read them. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, <laughs> the church. Get me started in the church. <laughs> I don't say it like that. I know. Oh, I'll get I'm hate mail. I'm still suffering from Catholic guilt. Yeah, me too. I, I yeah. can show you the flagellation there. Uh, yeah. I always say I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> but you know I'm, what? When I was researching the story, it nearly went the other way. The Gnostics were betrayed from within by any former. Uh, the Gnostics could have actually won this whole argument and they wouldn't have been persecuted and basically butchered by the fundamentalists because the mm. fundamentalists uh, won on a technicality simply because the others, other side was betrayed. So right now, we would have been in the Western world had the, ch the, the chance and the opportunity to follow a Gnostic version of Christianity, which actually is much closer to Buddhism and much closer to Native American teachings. So it's funny how things tend to go, and you know, it's luck of the draw. Yeah, because I mean, the Templars ended up following the Essenes and, and their teaching. Um, is this why they went to the Temple Mount? Because it's the Temple fun. Mount, King Solomon. I mean, that was a that was a pretty big thing, physical oh, ascension. Yeah. yeah, these are a bunch of guys and women. You don't get to hear about the women Templars very much, but they were all married. And uh, they waited a thousand years after the Essenes and everybody else was expelled from Jerusalem. And they laid low for a while. I mean, they'd learned that uh, sticking your head above the castle wall is going to get you burnt alive or shot or disemboweled. So uh, mm -hmm. you learned to survive for another day. And they were very patient. And there is a, a documentation that goes through time, uh, specifically that was found by Henry Lincoln and Michael Bajan and Michael Lee. Uh, who wrote the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and uh, I'm indebted to their research. They're incredible people, mm -hmm. and you can follow the trail. So these people were very patient for about a thousand years, and eventually the story really precedes the Templars. It was another group of uh, mystics uh, called the People of the Bear who essentially want to go back to Jerusalem to find something very secret. And they're talking about a divine bloodline that survived the crucifixion, which, by the way, never happened. It was supposed to be a metaphor. Uh, even Islam says the whole thing was a metaphor. It wasn't supposed to be taken literally. Uh, and they actually, and the Muslims hold Jesus up on the same uh, level as Muhammad. Just read the Quran. Uh, this is why it annoys me why so many people in the Christian world are, you know, uh, uh, devilifying uh, the Islamic people. I mean, there's a lot of respect for Jesus in the Quran. So what are we arguing about? So the idea was that when the Templars finally uh, decided to show their uh, their cards, there were also parts of uh, members of the Cistercian Order, who were another group of mystics who behaved just like the Essenes and even dressed like them. So they knew where they were going. They knew what they were looking for. There was nine guys who show up on the doorstep of the King of Jerusalem and said, hey, uh, we'd like to go and live in the house that you had just renovated. And <laughs> the king says, sure, go right in. 
I don't think that, you know, a king with an army was threatened by nine guys. I don't think he was, the threat from the small group of people was exactly what he was trying to, you know, to do it in order to give him the, uh, this, this house. The Templars put something in front of him and they said, we need this, this specific house because there's something very important we have to find. And he knew because he was part of that bloodline. So the Templars, we found the tunnels that they were digging were very deliberate. They were aiming and homing in on something and they kept missing it. And eventually they found it. And uh, when I was um, writing the, the first Templar Nation book, I had noted that in 1921, suddenly they stopped working. These nine knights hardly did any fighting. In fact, they hardly ever left Temple Mount. There were the minor nobles who gave up all of their money to go to Jerusalem to dig in really hot and uncomfortable conditions to find treasure. Uh, I don't buy that story. That's just so ludicrous. You mm -hmm. could have stayed at home, kept your money, and sat at home with your nice fireplace and your cognac. You didn't have to go to Jerusalem <laughs> to find money that you just given away. So the treasure really was a treasure of words. They call it the Sauro from when yes. we get the word thesaurus, and there's the clue. It was a treasure of words, because the next thing you know, a couple of Templars have some scrolls hidden in their tunics, they find their way back to Europe, all the way to Belgium, and they give them to a cryptographer. Now, why would you need a cryptographer to work looking for a treasure? Well, because the treasure was the words. It was the, the scrolls that led you to have this mystical experience, which the Templars then practiced in their preceptories, of which we found many of the secret chambers. And in fact, there is one in uh, Portugal, which is actually just up the road from where I was born, literally a couple of miles. And uh, it's underneath a cafe today, and you can go under there if you know the, the, the manager quite well. And it's a secret chamber where they used to practice the resurrection ceremonies, and uh, they would then yeah. come out for a, a shaft, they were declared risen, and they would always face the equinox sunrise, and specifically Venus before the equinox sunrise, which is the mark of the risen initiate everywhere around the world. So that's what, essentially what the Templars were doing. They were bringing back an old practice. And of course, they were loved for this because they said, hey, we can teach this to anybody. And of course, anybody who is a mind of peasant said, absolutely, I'll give you whatever two shekels I have to hang out with you guys, and I want to have the same experience. And meanwhile, I'm going to type some money and that's what made the Templars rich and adored throughout Europe, is because mm. they were just offering a kind of a protection racket against the church. They also had the ability to teach, uh, create classrooms for children, set up hospitals for the uh, frail, set up a kind of, um, how shall I say, a, a sort of a, 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 a little pot of money for people who were retiring so that when they retired, they could be looked after. So it was mm. almost a welfare system that was benevolent. It was like mm. a standard uh, welfare system where everybody was protected and you gave a little bit of your money to the next town so that they could raise themselves up from their state of barbarity. So essentially, that's a very Buddhist teaching. You help yourself to help others. Everybody rises to the same level. Everyone's resurrected and we'd all live happily ever after. So it was a very utopian ideal. And they, too, also almost got away with it. I like that almost. <laughs> um, well, I mean, they've obviously mastered it. You do tours. Now, if memory serves me correctly, when you do these tours and you, you do teach this or, you, you know, help people to get a little bit closer to what I'm going to call an addiction because it would be for me, I need an intervention. But do you do them in Portugal? Are there locations there that you take them? Uh, like I used to. Uh, I have to actually redo that tour again. Um, it was getting a little problematic getting places to stay because we, we I end up going to very remote places and uh, I'd have mm. to end up uh, putting I only take six people uh, in the, in that particular tour. I'd stick three in one uh, lovely old building, three in another old building. I have to go and hang out in someone's goat barn, which has a <laughs> tour. Oh, in well, order well. To actually, need a tour. They think I'm living the, the life of Riley. And here I am, sir, by goats in the morning. I mean, it was very nice, but, you know, the word doesn't get around that something's going on. Um, so I think we did the tour at some point. We were having way too much fun, and, and we did get to lie down in some of their uh, ritual graves on top of a mountain. Uh, there was one particular couple who were uh, very interesting. Uh, we'd actually drank the entire restaurant dry one evening, and I mean the only restaurant, and we drank, we drank it dry. 
and they still walked up to the top of the mountain in total darkness and they actually did the ceremony until three in the morning, came back down during the sunrise to pick me up out of my, uh, my bed and say, you need to some see something that we found at the top of the hill, which I completely missed. So we went back up there again and uh, found something quite extraordinary, uh, which I won't tell you right now because it's in the book. Um, <laughs> but this is the kind of stuff that we get up to. It's I very interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. It doesn't need the Templars, it doesn't need the graves. I mean, just going to stone circles, just going, having quiet time in the Great Pyramid and some of the pyramids that we go to in Egypt, it's the same thing. The idea is the same. The, the method is the same, is to get you acclimated to the essence of these temples. Um, the space within which you are going into have been measured to be very different from the space outside. There's a kind of a different energetic feel. And it's not just because you're open to, uh, and suggested to this, it, you can actually feel it, especially when there's nobody there, which mm -hmm. I can say, I have been now to Egypt three times during uh, the pandemic, and I am very fortunate that we take calculated risks. And so far, everyone's not only well, they're doing exceptionally well. Um, because I we have this quiet thing. <laughs> You know, and it's not just about me yakety yakating for, uh, for 10 days. Mm -hmm. I let you have as much quiet time as you can so you can take in the spirit of the place. And it changes people over 10 days. That does something to you. And then you mm -hmm. go and find your own way on your own, wherever you feel comfortable going around the world. Because it's a very solitary journey. It's supposed to be a solitary journey. You just need someone to show you the ropes and then you take over. Uh, and that's how I like to do things. So do you feel, as I've been to the Great Pyramid of Egypt, I've visited Saqqara, it's, this, it's a place like no other, it really is, yeah. you know. Um, do you think it was an actual tomb, in, you know, in the pyramid? There's so many different theories with it, but to be, you know, because you look at the sarcophagus, you're kind of like, it doesn't even look like it's ever been used. None of this is right, <laughs> you know. Do you think it was a chamber intended for living resurrection to connecting with your consciousness you think that's what it was and maybe that's why you had this like intense experience in there oh yeah i mean the, the great pyramid specifically you don't get the same experience in the middle pyramid or the little pyramid you, you have very different experiences in there uh, and totally different from out of body work and in fact there's some pyramids like the bed pyramid which is my favorite doesn't even have a box at all neither has the red pyramid no box in there <laughs> And you feel very different, and one of one's really used for healing. The other one I'm still working on. It's a, it reveals itself slowly. And then of course there are other pyramids which you've found completely sealed. And there's nobody inside. Even the box is completely sealed. There's nobody inside. So I mm. believe each one of them have a different function. Now, when I was researching the current book, The Missing Lands, um, I was looking at something very different. I was looking at the origin of the gods and where they came from and where they lived, and how they were all connected. Uh, which is a completely different show. But there was one thing that stuck out when I was looking at the origins of the oral traditions of the people of Easter Island called the Waitaha. Mm -hmm. And they moved to New Zealand a long, a long, long, long time ago. They actually described the flood and the people who were in the flood, which means that their accounts are over 12,000 years old. Mm -hmm. And they said that these gods, uh, it, although they don't describe them as gods, they describe them as special people. But in South America, the same people are described as gods. So got to be careful about this. Um, they said that every year when they were living on Easter Island, the gods used to arrive and uh, they used to deposit a little bit of their, their teachings into the tribe. And the tribe had three baskets. They called them the kete of knowledge. And in each uh, kete went the information for three different groups. Each one was associated with the three different stars of the belt of Orion. Now, we know from both Val and Gilbert's work that there is a very good match in the spring equinox of 10,400 BC of the belt stars aligning with the three Giza pyramids. Mm -hmm. Now, this, when I was just there having a quiet time on my own before the group arrived, it's, it's when the, the wonderful stuff really happens. You know, people think I spent, you know, a, a months and months reading stuff in libraries. Uh, I, I do, but not that much. Half of my work is actually done on the land, listening to the land and saying, what's this really about? And then just shutting up and letting things happen. And sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes mm -hmm. it really happens. And on this occasion, just sitting there looking at the free pyramids, and uh, I was being, I suddenly began to remember this story from the White Heart in New Zealand. And I was thinking, why am I thinking about this stuff in the Pacific when I'm in Egypt? Mm -hmm. And suddenly hit me, of course, because in the small, in one of the baskets, 
was meant for the people who were the uh, the wisdom keepers of the tribe, he heavy people, people who really wrote and recorded stuff. And then the middle basket was for the builders, the architects, the people who were implementing the words of the sages. But the third basket was for the seers, the people who connected into the other realms. And suddenly I realized, my God, it's been staring at me in the face for 20 years. The little pyramid, the energy is always very intense. It's like, yes, that's a kind of intensity when you're writing and thinking. The mm. middle pyramid, actually, it's very balanced. There's actually, uh, you don't really feel anything special there at all. It's mm -hmm. just... Uh, it's, it's nice, but it's not, uh, it's just right. it's very, there. <laughs> uh, very methodical. And I think that's the kind of thing that would feel if I was implementing something. You know, it's, it's a strategy. Mm. But the third building, oh, it's a definitely a very out-of-body place, the kind of place where a seer would be associated with. And that's when it finally hit me. These people in uh, New Zealand and East Island had the answer all along. And, of course, their connection is also, of their gods, it, they're also related to Orion. So that is the connection. And by the way, um, the nickname that they gave them, the Shining Ones, is the same nickname of the builders of the pyramids, who are also called the Shining Ones, the followers of Horus. So there's the overlap mm -hmm. to the story. So I, I find that that um, hypothesis quite, you know, has a good foundation to it. Mm -hmm. Until the next uh, information comes out, it'll probably, it'll probably change. No, oh, great. There's another book. <laughs> another show. <laughs> Yay, let's go. <laughs> I think Michelle's just going to drop her bank account with you. Just give you exactly. full access. It's just an order. It might happen. It's a book, actually, but it's not about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the tall beings, when you say the shining ones, are you talking about the, the you know, the tall beings that dress in white, giants? Is, is this all connected together? With not giants, they're just very tall people, uh, eight and a half feet to nine feet tall. That's uh, tall, yeah. the height around the world. I guess it's all relative. That's I, twice I the size be... of Amelia, though, Fred. Like, ah. <laughs> that would be a giant to Amelia. To She's me, it's just very tall. I mean, it's yes. six foot five, so I'll be like, oh, dad. Um, it's like five yeah. one, five two. No, I'm not. I'm five four, and yeah, I'm five eleven in heels. <laughs> to spread fruit, I'm considered a god, so there you go. It's all relative. But no, <laughs> just very, very tall. And the ancient cultures that we still have with us today, we're very comfortable with them. They're, they're described as human like, but not quite human. Mm -hmm. And they were very light skinned. Uh, they had red hair with green eyes, or they were blonde with blue eyes. And they That's kept anointing themselves with a kind of oil, um, usually the crocodile fat, I'm, I'm, I know discovered, because they had a real problem with sunlight. And the, given that the area from where they come from, where the earth was much colder, yeah, because after the Ice Age, things got much more warm, the sun was stronger, so they had to protect their skin like we have to do when we go to the beach. It makes perfect sense now. Mm -hmm. um, they were just the, the very tall people. The giants really came in from a different uh, story, which really came after the flood. So we're now at 9,700 BC or thereabouts, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a group of people who were the craftsmen uh, who surrounded the core group of gods called the Anu, or the Anunnaga, or the mm -hmm. Anunnaki, who were also the Urukeu, who were the Vidakoshas. They were all the same people. Mm -hmm. They just inspired by different names around the world. And they were very benevolent people, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what you hear about on the internet, it's all absolute nonsense what you're hearing. The nonsense really comes down to the small group of watchers who were the cross people who defied orders not to marry with human women. You go, yeah. okay, they're lovely, they're beautiful, but don't go hang out with them because the DNA doesn't match. It's going to be a problem. So there's a small group of these craftspeople that defied the orders and went down from this big mountain somewhere in Mesopotamia uh, to hang out with women and teach uh, humans, hunter-gatherers, things which hunter-gatherers shouldn't know at their level of development. Mm. That's where the problems began. So when the children uh, begat their, their uh, um, babies, they came out the side of infants. It killed the mothers. And the, there's a group of Native Americans called the Wichita in Oklahoma. So it's not a town, it's an actual people. Uh, they still have the story where once upon a time, uh, these people came to, uh, to our tribe and uh, you know, they took women for wives and the women died in childbirth. The, the babies were the size of infants and those were the problem. And they were called the Nephilim, which means the sons of Orion. So there's yes. the connection. And they said that these 
kids were kind of normal, but big when they grew uh, when they were young. But suddenly, they began to outgrow everybody by as much as fourteen feet, Jeez. and they're living on the island of Sol- uh, the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. Uh, in fact, one of them one of them actually washed up on the beach in New Zealand in the fifties, and they were still living in New Zealand on uh, the hill of the red haired beings which the Maori were interacting with only as late as the 18th century. So there were still, wow. there still traces of them around. These were the problem, okay? These people were eating people for fun. They would cause warfare just because it was a game, and they ran amok. So what happened? Uh, the lords of Anu and the Watchers instigated the flood to wipe the earth clean. Uh, and they were very, if you read the, the original story of the Book of Enoch, uh, which is actually not his real name, his real name is Emmanuel Anu. He was one of them, and uh, he's, uh, you can see this terrible moment where they're looking at the destruction, and it's a, you can really feel that they're welling up inside them. It's like you know we had no choice. If we had not obliterated the earth, uh, because uh, these uh, children of the uh, of the bastard renegade sons of the Watchers, um, if we had not obliterated all these people today, the earth would be run by fourteen foot tall. Giants covered with red hair who were barbaric. Humans would have disappeared from the record. So we mm. owed a small modicum of gratitude for what was done. And that's where we get the story of groups of humans discovering civilization quite magically around the world around 8,500 BC. Suddenly mm-hmm. we discovered mathematics, astronomy, astrology, uh, um, agrarian culture, the uh, animal husbandry, all the things that that are the foundation of civilized behavior, uh, letters and so forth. Well, the only explanation is that there was someone from somewhere else that landed in strategic parts of the world and they told us how to do it. And those were the surviving gods. They They were appeared in strategic parts of the world. Seven, groups of seven, one of them was a woman who was the wisdom keeper. She carried the bloodline, and she was the sister and married to the eighth guy who was the charismatic leader. So these are your Vidakoshas, your Quetzalcoatl, your Kukulkan, your Itzamna, and so forth. Uh, so, and Horus, of course, is one of them. So mm-hmm. that's the story. They essentially re kickstart civilization, and here we are talking on a computer, uh, you know, <laughs> a thousand years later. Right. It's it's fascinating to me that um, they're still around, you know, into the 18th century. You just wash up on the shore. It's like, pff, how functional are you going to be after that? It's just seeing something <laughs> like that, you know, well, coming in. America as well. I mean, when the Cherokee were moving across America, uh, they reached uh, what today would be West Virginia and Appalachia. And they said that we bumped into a group of what used to be a once proud race of people, uh, who came from a, a land that sank in the big ocean to the east, surprise, surprise. And uh, they, were, they were red-headed people. They were very tall, brutish. They'd run out of hope because they were interbreeding. Uh, they couldn't uh, breed with uh, human women, so they lost hope. But they had such a proud heritage that we incorporated their cosmology into ours so that no one would ever forget. And to make sure that their name was never forgotten, the Alawani, as they were called, we gave their name to a river that goes through Pittsburgh called the Allegheny River. That's, oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Oh, my goodness. I did not know that. That's interesting. That's not all that far from here. Um, Where about are you? Well, Niagara Falls, Canada. So it's about probably. It's a, it's a bit of a drive. <laughs> from you, yeah, just a little. <laughs> when you a few from, times. Once you get to the border, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, <laughs> you're kind you of stuck the big there. Continent. That's just down the road. I mean, in Britain, it, if you it, took four it, hours, it's, yeah, it's, it's on a slight mind, you know. No, yeah. I, I, yeah, I've done it a few times. I mean, I, I, I love Pennsylvania, so it's you know, I, it's one of my favorite states to go to. But yeah, definitely not like England, where you're weirder. Yeah, you drive you drive ninety miles per hour, and you go off the cliff, and you're in the ocean. It's, you can't drive very far there. No, but <laughs> it's so beautiful though, England. Everything the is countryside cheap. Countryside is gorgeous. Yeah. Well, you know, I notice here it costs us about, you know, I don't know, like twelve dollars just to to go on a forty minute train ride, and I'm sitting here in in Scotland. And for $10, it's a four-hour trip up to Inverness from Glasgow, and they have a booze cart. (laughs) What? 
and she got a that's what got you yeah, it was the a, booze which, it wasn't the ten dollars she would have paid 20 for that cart yeah. <laughs> and in france you also get a carriage with booze and fresh croissant warmed in the oven by the way okay oh. see. And you're not allowed to talk on your cell phone or work on computers you have to read books or talk quietly oh that's there, nice that's, that's kind of hard to do after a few a few toddies on the line I love. No, I have. I have no filter after half a glass of wine. I can't imagine being on that train. These I, people are architects of style. Yeah. yeah. I was in France. I just drove. South of France is beautiful. To you can just drive forever. You know, I love mountains. I just eyed the Pyrenees, and that was it for me. So, so um, yeah. Wow. That's that is that's fascinating. So when you say that, well, j jumping back for a second to resurrection and. And you you go over to the other side. Everybody's experience is very personal. So what do you make of people like Plato or Isaac Newton are coming back with all of this knowledge and they're just blabbering it all off to everybody? <laughs> so, clearly, the rules would apply to them. <laughs> well, yeah, but they didn't tell you how they did it. Uh, right. you, have to, you have to find the trail. I mean, like Leonardo da Vinci was one of them. You have to find out which societies they belong to, what they were practicing and how. And then you make a connection. You know, right. the last gap of the story is always missing, obviously. But you begin to realize that after they've gone for a certain period of, of missing time in their chronology, you realize that after when they come back, they're writing a lot. They'll come up with the extraordinary stuff. Well, yeah, because they've had information. They've had access to this library, and they're able to implement it. So they're doing it quietly, but overtly at the same time. So but they didn't tell you how they got up, you know, how they did it. People just assume that they spent years in libraries trying to figure out the how gravity works. Actually, mm. um, Newton actually gave the game away when he said, actually, it was when an apple fell on my tree. I don't think that actually happened in real life. That was his symbol <laughs> to get people who have their nose close to the pot saying, wait a minute. That's just, <laughs> of course, the symbol is right there. You know, the apple mm -hmm. of knowledge, Adam and Eve, yes. get you fighting from the tree of knowledge which, of course, is a symbol of that That's particular right. experience. So you have to read the metaphor and the language of symbology in initiation mm -hmm. in order to understand what they're talking about. And then it's actually quite easy. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like looking into a Gothic cathedral and looking around the pillars and things that don't quite belong and little symbols here and there. If you know what you're looking for, you can mm -hmm. find all kinds of wonderful things. And, you know, uh, I, I wrote a, a, an e-book on Charter Cathedral just for that reason. I watched mm -hmm. people going through the building, uh, being told, you know, and on your left, there's Jesus being crucified, and on your right, there's Jesus. And the whole building is basically a very Catholicized version of what is actually there, because 90% of the information, you just miss it. And I watch people on uh, iPads, uh, which is a real revelation to me, since I don't even use a cell phone. I think, mm. hey, what if I could put an e-book out and people would actually read my book when they're going for Chartres Cathedral? And that was my way of getting uh, back at the um, custodians of the building who kicked me out of the building. Uh, for uh, Bastards. Uh, <laughs> information in the building. I said, but, but it's right there. Wow. <laughs> you know, so that was my way of getting back at them. And it's doing very well right now on Amazon, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> are, wow. you, are you afraid that all of this will be lost in the next generation? Because they're not exactly a generation of metaphors. They're more a generation of Google, sadly. I know. It's yeah. Sad. yeah. I, I say that about my daughter. I said, you're going to have arthritis before you're 30. And she's 24. Like, it's crazy. Oh, I think there's a whole section of people in the current generation who are way ahead of all of us. But there's also a bigger dichotomy right now between uh, the, yeah, the between civilization. We have uh, we've reached a level of sophistication and access to so much information like never before, and yet we have a great amount of stupidity, and also people who are doing extraordinary things. Uh, I mean, the, the the gap is really quite wide uh, for the first time in history. I mean, uh, 600 years ago. Uh, I think two percent of the population of Europe was actually lettered. The rest were just morons. Uh, they were actually eating each other for dinner. I'm not kidding here. They actually uh, cannibalism was the main food on the uh, the menu at least once a week. So we've come a long way, but at the same time, we have so much access to everything, and we've caused so much stupidity because all of this fun twiddling is leading to what they call mind blindness, where you become lazy. You want that. You want that little black square that you're tethered to all the day long to tell you what to do. 
So this is why I wrote First Templar Nation, which is a book that forces you to think. And you get a headache from it, but my God, it's really worth it. At least oh, no, I don't get a headache. Honestly, because I just you eat it up. You are part of the story. Yes. And it's so enlightening. You feel alive when you realize, I've just gone through a personal experience reading a book. That was the whole point of that, you see. Mm-hmm. Whereas Lost Art of Resurrection was kind of a, a short book, which gives you the, the big picture. So it was my mm-hmm. way of having a bit of fun. But... No, I, I don't think it will die. I, I think it will just morph into something else. Uh, for example, if you look at what Walt Disney was doing, it's full of initiatory information. Um, uh, there's, uh, I'm trying to think of a few other films. Star Wars is a great example of the initiate. Mm-hmm. Starts off the light, gets seduced by fear. He has to protect Padme. He has this dream that she's going to die giving uh, birth to their child. What does he do? Goes into the fear mode, seduced by the dark side. Goes completely the other way. But what happens? At the very gate of death, he recognizes his error. He's gone too far to the other side. He has redeemed himself. And that's the whole point of Star Wars. It's the redemption of the initiate who's lost the plot. But at least he knows both sides of the equation, the light and the dark. And he knows to walk the line in between. That's what initiation is all about. So mm-hmm. not losing it, it's in the current vernacular of popular culture. And mm-hmm. for those who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, as Jesus once said, it's all there. But again, not everybody is ready for that because we're all coming here as individual souls looking for something very different, a different experience. Some people come here to be stupid. Some people come here to be very smart. Some come here to be very rich and some uh, give their money away to go and, uh, you know, uh, to take care of lepers in India their entire life, like Mother Teresa. So Mm -hmm. it's a personal individual journey, but we have all the tools at our disposal. If you're aware of this stuff and you're open, uh, it's all there. Well, sometimes we need somebody like you. (laughs) Well, now now I'm going to watch Star Wars. I'm just saying. I've never seen it. So now I want to 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 read the Templars again. And in fact, there was some. (laughs) I have that book. Don't talk about episode one. It never happens. It never happened. There was one geek who actually figured it out. The only way to understand Star Wars is do in this uh, sequence four, five. I'm writing this down. (laughs) <laughs> very important. And actually, it makes a lot of sense. I actually try this technique and it really works. Okay. Okay, so you go to four, five, mm-hmm. two, three, and then six. And okay. then six. So I, well. think, I think I saw well. that on the Big Bang Theory. I think Sheldon Cooper said like pop culture, but you know, they, they bring a lot forward. I think he said something about episode one and how to watch it. We do one not of the talk girls, about episode one. We don't one. talk about oh. episode one. I have the original game board, if anyone wants it. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, it intact. It's not intact. <laughs> no. yeah, Everything's on video now. So. A long-eared rabbit thing, which there was one quality newspaper in Britain, and children come, your ears, uh, they call them a swamp twat. Oh. <laughs> And when episode two came out, they said, thank God George Lucas finally got rid of that swamp twat. <laughs> they were not very complimentary about Jar Jar Binks. Nice. Oh, I know. It was so annoying after a while. But, <laughs> you know, you I have don't know children, you have to watch them all. I don't know. I, I was always sort of a the, get into the competition between Star Wars and Star Trek. Prime Directive. Don't say anything. So when you're talking, I'm going Prime Directive. Okay, you're right. You can't just go sharing that crap up. You've got to keep it to yourself, right? But honestly. But back to the Lost Art of Resurrection. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes you do need somebody who, who can just, like, you know, you write your book, you do the research, because you just research. I've said this to you the last time. You research in a way that, to me, is mind-blowing when i found out how much time you put into researching your templar history i'm just like god did you not retire after that like it's just <laughs> craziness but uh, i couldn't true. stop My reading brain was not quite the same after that i found life really hard to cope with I mean, 800 references living in four different countries in four different time periods i wrote the book like a play to make it oh. engaging fun yeah. as fun as you could do and it is a great book i mean it's it my is. Uh, for me, it's it's my pinnacle because it, it, it challenged me at every level. It's a challenging book, but my God, there's so much good stuff in it that's right there and self-empowering for people. 
Um, but no, it takes time. Good research takes time. I mean, it's a bit like waiting for an album from Boston, you know, 10 years. And then you make an album. <laughs> Every and seven be, years, yeah, you get a new one. It's like... <laughs> unless you're Graham Hancock and you can afford to hire research assistants. Oh, sure. You know, I am the research assistant. Exactly. I am the, I am the writer. So, <laughs> bless him, he does a fantastic job too. And, uh, you know, but no, good, good things take time. You have to follow through. And, uh, and, and I think there's something very interesting when people are following the right path. You have no idea where you're going. You don't know what the plan is. You have a, a broad brushstroke, but you don't really know where things are going. Mm -hmm. You just kind of like uh, in a very innocent childlike manner. And it's incredible what pops out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll talk to my librarian, who's my best friend. And um, in fact, I have one that lives downstairs from me as well. <laughs> and, uh, I'll just mention something in passing, and uh, they kind of know who I am now. And, uh, you know, Maine's are the best-selling author, because we know who the other one is. Uh, and, um, and they'll say, well, have you tried this? And I thought, no, I hadn't considered that at all. And boom. And suddenly you're on a different uh, platform altogether. And before you realize it, you you stretch your own boundaries as well, uh, mm -hmm. because you have to learn about toxicology and, uh, you know, out-of-body states and how these mm -hmm. connect with near-death experiences. And then I bump into an expert on near-death experiences at a conference in Montreal. We had dinner and we're exchanging information. So it's, it's quite magical. And I, I really do, uh, uh, you know, I love my job. It's difficult, but I do love it because I have no idea where I'm going. And it's, it really is a magic carpet ride. And, and to see people getting benefit from it at the end is, is even better because, you know, when I physically die, I hope I've made the world a better place by 1%. And that's good enough, you know. Oh, my well, gosh. I think you've, at I think least. you've far, yeah, gone far at past least. that. Rock star, look what happens. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> you're on yeah. TV every, you're on my television every single day. Oh, I'm sorry. Lie. Doesn't matter where, no, oh my gosh. It, you know, I love read. watching you and I learn so much. It, I'm so fascinated. And Michelle was it's the one the who told me about too. you. And all of a sudden you were everywhere. The accent <laughs> yeah. helps a lot. Ours is horrible, but that helps a lot. Everybody but it, thinks it, we're British. I have bad news for you. There's two more documentaries coming. Ooh, <laughs> yay. That is fantastic. And, and I love watching them. Gaia is going to be a very busy place this year. So no. I love oh, Gaia. Oh. Or if you That's still have a DVD player, you'll be I first to see it on my website. Yes, <laughs> I, I do. do. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm like, give me the DVD. People who still want DVDs in the world. Oh, I, I bought do. I bought a few of them. I bought yeah, a couple I of DVD players when they were down to like $30 because you're going to have things like family films that you haven't transferred yet. Or a lot of people are buying DVDs. Oh, I absolutely. noticed you, you have a lot of them up there. Yeah. It's, oh, huge. You can I mean, buy a uh, DVD drive and just put 200 it. Of them. Yeah, because oh, yeah. you, you bought it, you own it. It's yours. You know, you have to keep paying a, a service like Flix. Yeah. Every time you want to see something or the uh, some of the online store, I do not recommend ever using. Um, but uh, you're constantly paying and paying and paying and paying, and mm. the artist getting paid that much for it so you right. already paid it once you've got a disc it's yours you own it it's like having a car you don't rent the car out each time you need the car unless no, it's you're <laughs> no, it's unless true. you're super rich it's true I'm I'd, rather have, it. I'd rather have it in my hot little hands exactly but I'd show my landline but it's a bit out of reach no <laughs> I know and I said okay we have to download Chrome I know we haven't downloaded anything I'm not going to use. <laughs> okay, just, Skype yeah, it is. Just at the airport <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, now you've got to have your 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 boarding pass on your phone. Oh, so yeah. I had to go to eBay and buy an iPhone 5. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. And then, and then I'm upset because back. I have a 6, and I you just got a 12. And a 12. Is that the 6 yeah. already? Yeah. I put the phone down on the counter and the uh, the lady at the uh, check-in place says, that's the smallest one I've ever seen. And I turned around and said, she's talking about my iPhone 5. Thank you. <laughs> that's terrifying. Yeah. And she had no idea what it was. I mean, I said, so what do you use? And she pulls out this massive iPhone well, the, 400. The 12 is so big. The 12 I've got the 11. Really it's we're going it. back to the ridiculous. Yeah. I we're know. going back to that. Yeah, they shouldn't take it on airplanes. It's like having an offensive weapon. At least mine can go through. It's tiny. You can't kill somebody with an iPhone 5. 
But with yeah, an iPhone like, X, that's dangerous. They're sticking that in your grommies, <laughs> that's for sure. It's like, you know, that's not a thing for sure. But well, I, the good, the great I, thing about iPad, sorry, Apple, sorry, Michelle, just because we're still on DVDs. The great thing about Apple is that we? you can buy. I am. We, you can buy the drive and attach it to your computer or to your TV and watch Freddy's DVDs. So yeah. you don't need to have a DVD player. You can just buy the drive. It's under I just bought bucks. Freddy's website. Oh, I'm talking to you in an iMac 2012, which still has the DVD drive in it. Yeah. <laughs> and you can plug your little guitar in it and do weird things. <laughs> weird things with cognac. <laughs> yeah, you, you usually get to hear them on my DVDs. It's called a soundtrack. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, I refuse to go beyond the 2012 iMac. It's uh, it's wonderful, wonderful machine. <laughs> anyway, back to the last time. I'm not of far off of that actually. <laughs> <laughs> right along with you with the 2012. <laughs> Good Lord. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, um, no, what basically what I was what I was saying was with your research, you don't seem to take no for an answer. The one thing about doing research yourself, you'll delve and you'll delve and you'll delve. And I really realized that when you were again, it's getting back to to the Templars, when you found information on the priori of Seon, it's all this controversy around this, and you somehow okay, find this fun little snippet of information as to how it existed way back yeah. in the 1600s. I'm like, who the hell finds something like that? It's like a needle yeah. in a haystack, right? It was, I think it was Philip, uh, Louis XIV that actually brought a whole group of the Priore de Sion back yeah. from Jerusalem. So there must have been a real people. And it mm. gives them a house, so there must have been real people living in a real house. And the document was still uh, still going, and it was only destroyed in the Second World War by the Luftwaffe. And I've got to give credit again to um, uh, Beige and B and uh, Leah Lincoln, because they're the ones that put me on that trail. Uh, yeah. They have already found the paperwork going all the way back to, the. Uh, I think it was when the Templars were, well, officially indoctrinated as Templars in uh, uh, outside of Jerusalem. I can't remember the, the, the town where it was done, but mm -hmm. it was done on the grounds of the Ordre de Sion, uh, so that's a natural record. That, there's a natural people. The, uh, the whole idea of where the Priory became a bit of a joke really came when they uh, were given information to put out there to be published. And, of course, the, the, the cat was out of the bag. So mm. I suspect, and I, I believe uh, Henry Lincoln also, also mentioned this at one point, that the church or someone working for the church or the Inquisition, because they, they are still around today, by the way, they just changed their name. The office of the Inquisition is a real office in the Vatican today. Uh, yeah. And it said that someone made up this story of these guys that said the whole story of the Priory prior of Sion was a big hoax. Well, it wasn't a hoax until they found out about the Priory of Sion, and then right. the out of the bag and suddenly, oh, we're going to put the lid back. Uh, so yeah. the manufacture, it was like crop circles. Suddenly <laughs> crop circles have been taken seriously. Even the military are looking at these beams creating crop circles. Well, suddenly you have Doug and Dave uh, that are manufactured to throw everybody off the sand. And it's so easy to put doubt into a story and 50% of the public just goes away. That's mm -hmm. how it's done. It's that easy. And essentially the whole story of the, the um, uh, uh, the Priory being a big joke was fabricated in order to keep you off the track. Of uh, which is when um, my former neighbor, Dan Brown, writes the Da Vinci Code, the church spent $15 million debunking a fictional book. Well, why would you debunk a <laughs> book? Why would they do that? And again, that gives you a uh, cat out of the bag again. But uh, they're trying mm. to put the genie back in the bottle. But it's too late now. No, exactly. They've been trying to shush everything up. I, I, I'd love. I would just love. Keep pushing the envelope all the time and see where you go. It's the only way to keep looking. But, uh, but again, I'm, I'm also. I mean, it's not just me. It's also people that I try to find people who have also found similar ideas that mm. are able to support my hypothesis, and eventually I'll bring them into the conversation so that mm. they can get the credit too. This is not a one-man operation. This is a. a, a this is like a multi or. Uh, I don't know, a major corporation with thousands of people looking under big stones and somehow we just connect with each other and we help each other formulate these hypotheses. Is the only way you can really do it. Uh, it's too much job for one person. 
You, but you're essentially, in many cases, rewriting history. You must be getting some kind of resistance from academics. Oh, just check my, face, my Facebook page. They're all there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a group called Ancient History and Mystery or something. And uh, Oh, there's a whole bunch of trolls there. And I actually click, you know, once in a while when I have nothing better to do, because I don't follow trolls and I don't respond to people on mm -hmm. Facebook because it's just a waste of time. And it's designed to be a waste of time. Mm -hmm. If people say something encouraging or they want to know more, then I will encourage them and I'll, you know, I'll answer them as best as I can, but uh, I'll go and click on these people who are trawling me and disparaging me, and they are academics, and most of them are from Britain, which is kind of weird. Uh, so, and they're the ones also going on Amazon, giving me one-star ratings, and it's yeah. the same people giving Graham Hell. Hancock, Andrew Collins, right. and everybody else of the same genre one-star ratings to bring skepticism into their work. So it's like a cabal of academics who right. basically put their ivory towers to fall down, and our point is, we're not attacking you. We're just saying that the story is incomplete and the information that we're coming out with makes a lot more sense than the one that you're following. So we're uncovering things that really should expand our understanding, not limiting it. And they're mm. coming in from the direction is, no, I've staked my position on this, but you can't stake your position on history. It's not possible because tomorrow mm. some unnerves something in a rubbish bin somewhere and it will alter, alter the course of who Shakespeare was or who Jesus was, and so forth. Well, if you're going to stick to your side of the story, you, you've fallen down. You, you're an idiot, really. I mean, when you think about it, mm -hmm. you have to go with where the information goes. So if someone tomorrow said, okay, I found something about the Templars which completely disproves your book, I go, great, thank you. I'm glad you said that. Now we can start another story because the story was good up until that point. Because mm -hmm. up until that point, we had this much information. We drained the information out of that uh, little bag. We came up with that hypothesis. Now this new information comes out. Okay, let's put that aside. Let's see how that story can evolve. That's called science. <laughs> it's quite it simple. It is. The story relative to the information that you're privy to. And the sort of pushback really comes from people on social media who are actually mostly academics, but I get very little pushback, oddly enough. I, I don't, I guess it's because people who are much more in the limelight get all the arrows, which means that people on the, uh, on the, on the B roll, like me, uh, and I'm very happy to be on the B roll, we get less arrows, we can get on with more work. So I actually <laughs> have you know, with, uh, with Graham Hancock, uh, who's a, a good colleague and I admire him. Mm. Uh, he gets all the arrows and all of us are kind of hiding behind him. Right. <laughs> so we buy him drinks whenever we see him because we encourage him to keep going forwards because it, it means we can get on with more work. <laughs> right, he just takes it for the team, basically. <laughs> it's a bit of a game, really, when it comes down. Yeah. And I think he's Scottish, so he can take it. He can, he can take out. it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but eventually I think it connects all the dots. I think, you know, you came forward, like I said, I, I've read a lot of different um, literature. And when it came to the Templars, I kept thinking to myself, finally, somebody who's got it right. Oh, my gosh, this all makes sense. I'm thinking, good grief, it, it all makes sense, you know. But I think, again, it, it opened doors for people like uh, Kathleen Ann Ball, for example, where you say you can't eventually history will will show itself and let's come on the templar cave in brazil yeah i mean it's not like you can't date some of that stuff you know um predates columbus by 200 years somebody what along the, the line somebody would have had to say okay columbus really you know there's so many people that have been here long before him Right, so he, Columbus. Columbus didn't even land in America. It's, it's, it's it's, I, know. <laughs> I know. So, and here's but, a funny thing: America is not even named. Uh, it's not even named after America Vespucci. That's actually a fable that was invented by some magazines in Germany in the 17th century. There was a vicar who uh, fancied himself as a amateur historian, and he cobbled together uh, all these unconnected uh, ideas. Um, and kind of like a, a lot of stuff on uh, YouTube these days, things that get uh, totally disconnected, but somehow they're glued together and they're <laughs> with this fact. And there's so much of this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But he uh, uh, eventually came up with the idea that it was America Vespucci that lent his name to America. It's actually not true at all. The people that founded the, uh, this country were uh, Freemasons. They were in contact with the French Freemasons. And if you follow that story all the way back to the origin of Freemasonry and, and their connections to the Middle East, you'll know that the mark of the risen initiate 
is to keep following the star in the west. That's your, it's the path. You're following the star that goes towards the underworld, the setting sun. It's a mm -hmm. path to you to keep chasing. It's mm -hmm. a dream. Uh, but the dream eventually becomes reality if you follow that dream far enough. And the name of the star was called America. So incredibly, America is named after an Arabic star. So this whole idea of, you know, Americans always bashing yeah. Arab and Love things. It. That's mm -hmm. actually, that's the fundamental that's creating a lot of problems. And in fact, Michael Bajan wrote a very good book about the current situation in America, uh, how uh, why there's so much Arab bashing here. Uh, and he's got a very, very good point. And I, I think it makes a lot of sense. It mm -hmm. really comes down to one faction trying to create a wedge between all of us and people who really uh, have nothing against us. And, and uh, I've been to Egypt so many times and I've got mm -hmm. great friends there felt threatened and oh, even it's when lovely we to, there yeah we come out of the pyramids and there's guards there um in fact uh, on this last trip we went to the assyrian and they gave us two hours of free time to meditate in the assyrian and this uh, time people from a five-star general actually joined the meditation wow and he's, and he's a muslim and it's like wow that was beautiful and wow. said, yeah it's not about religion it's about coming together and having a collective experience and and, th and then i had a whole bunch of military people show up and, the, and, they, and they had their guns and they just sat there and they closed their eyes for, with us for 45 minutes and they were very quiet. Mm -hmm. And it shows you. And then it's like, why, why, why do you come to Egypt? I said, because I feel safe here. That was my answer. I said, I actually feel safe around these people. And then we all hugged each other and kissed each other. Forget COVID, you know. The, yeah. the, Arab, the Arabic idea oh, of social distancing. Three kisses <laughs> on the cheek and a big hug. I thought, and so far, we're all okay. I mean, we're very lucky. We do take calculated risks. But, yeah, I, I think this whole wedge thing is, uh, has got to stop. We have to wake up to what's really going on. Uh, and, uh, and it goes back to initiation again. It's about mm -hmm. being aware of the big picture and standing back far enough to understand how these um, clowns are on stage creating all this division, which is keeping us all apart. It, there's nothing really new in this story. It's about mm -hmm. coming together, understanding the big picture, how everything functions and being in control of it and not mm -hmm. falling for fear. So I'd say that's a good sort of use of three years of learning. If you could learn to control your fear and have a degree of omnipresence so you can see into the future and see what's going to happen. And it really does give you that ability to sort of see forward in time. Uh, I was just chatting with my um, um, financial advisor today and we're having a good laugh. And I said, you know, it's funny, I get a really bad feeling about this particular time in 2022. We're going to see a crash like you've never seen. And so far, I've guessed each one of these crashes right on the dot. Uh, even last February, I said, uh, I'm taking all my money out of the stock market. And just before I left for Yucatan, yeah. boom, the whole thing collapsed. I thought, there you go. They know to again, sell, sell the house well, before 2022. Before, before oh, my free. gosh. Yeah. I have just my appointment tomorrow at noon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank sell you. the house. <laughs> going to have to start liquidating a few things. Is, you begin to get a sense of how things mm -hmm. are around you. And you get this, yeah. this ability to see just as far ahead enough and go, wait a minute, something here doesn't quite smell right, I need to adapt. Uh, yeah. You do have a certain degree of control of the world around you, so I totally encourage it because it's a great teaching. So is is the whole living resurrection process, uh, the, whole, the, whole, the whole concept of it, is it still being done today? Oh yeah, you just have to Aside go from look you? very weird <laughs> because I mean the lawyers would jump all over you if you said, so what's your business model? Well, we give the initiate a poison uh, through the day. He yeah. or she dies. Uh, technically, you're comatose, you're dead. And then three days later, you come back into the body. He goes, well, um, no, I'm sorry, we can't have that. <laughs> um, there's no insurance company that's going to cover you for that. And uh, if you go to deepest Guatemala on the Amazon, uh, there are people who will say, actually, give us six months of your time and uh, we'll teach you what we know. And then you'll have a... A kind of an experience but to do it properly a bit longer but minimum six months so yeah it's, mm. it's still practice it's still practice within the navajo tradition the hopi you really have to befriend them and they have to trust you and after what they've been through with white people i don't blame them at all no no um, not so, at all. yeah no parts of the, of the pacific in small groups they keep it themselves to themselves uh, mm -hmm. But I'm told that Kriya Yoga is one way of doing it, uh, especially as it's practiced in India, which is all to do with manipulating your Merkaba, your, your energy body, 
Because mm-hmm. that's all it is, manipulating your energy body because this is not who you are. This is who you are. Something mm-hmm. very If you can work that, and again, that takes you a good year to get really into it. Uh, you can go out of body anytime you want, every, any way you want, just like that. Uh, and then, um, But also going into temples does the same thing too, ancient temples, because if you do it on your own quietly, you are going into a rarefied space where the laws of physics are so slightly different that it allows you to escape for a few seconds, for a few minutes. And that's mm-hmm. all you need to get a taste of what's going on to remind yourself of who you are and why you came here. And, and the more you do it, it becomes like driving your car, it becomes second nature. So mm-hmm. for me, in, in my work, you know, I want to have five minutes to myself in all these temples. I just go away with the fairies and I download information. Boom, oh, that's a good idea. That would be a great book. Boom, mm-hmm. and, it, and the process begins. So that's how I do it. That's my library. Uh, I go there to recharge, to rebuild myself, and also to heal myself. They're incredible healing places, but they're solitary places. You should do it by by yourself, uh, mm-hmm. whether it's a stone circle or a Native American mound, uh, a Gothic cathedral. Uh, it doesn't matter. The trick is to find your own tool that works for you. Uh, mm-hmm. And for some people, it's music. Uh, jazz is a very good way of doing it. I mean, I find I'm having an out-of-body experience listening to good jazz, but mm-hmm. and that's another matter. So it's, it, it's, we have so many tools at our disposal. The trick is to find the one that works for you and to keep applying it. But here's mm. the trick. Don't expect anything. If you expect something, it won't happen. Mm. The less you expect, the more it happens. And then it, you realize you're in the middle of this magical world. And you really realize you're being very supported by a lot mm. of people. And we all are very supported by a lot of people. It's just that we're always never aware of them because we're always twiddling around with this thing all day long, oh, you know, no, watching know. a screen all day long. So you've got to get away from that so mode. Go outside and, uh, you know, smell the sea breeze. Those hundred acres out in the woods by the lake is looking more and more enticing. <laughs> just Absolutely. get away from yeah. it all. Yeah, do a lot of earthing and just grounding and, and see where you end up. Um, but I know we've kept you longer than. Uh, oh than... my God! Past my bedtime. Where's my I hot know. Dog? I'm sorry. I Where's figured you'd be loading up again and having another glass. <laughs> I was just gonna say that'll do the trick. Wow. There, you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. Okay, so you're still okay. <laughs> I, I recommend this. Actually, well, this you is really you go thing. through enough airports, Freddie, that you can afford to bring those those bottles home. <laughs> oh God, no! Actually, this gets yeah. in the way. Uh, like I said, it's good to just to lubricate the machinery because it actually gets in the yeah. way uh, alcohol. But it's kind of funny. On my last trip, I actually had to fly uh, business class to Egypt so I can get a bed. And it was actually mm. very reasonable. I had the entire section to myself. There were four people in British oh. Airways actually waiting on me. We're having a really good laugh and cracking jokes. <laughs> and I said, you know, I said, I've done this three times during COVID. I'm very lucky. And it is a calculated risk. You know, there is a real pandemic out there, but you've got to take care of yourself and your immune system. And I said, you know what the funny thing is? Um, camphor. Put camphor up your nose regularly because yes. it actually cured the uh, Chinese from bubonic plague. There's the irony for the story. Uh, and, uh, you know, the old Vicks vapor rub. Uh, yes. You take out, I've it been only has it forever. Camphor. Yeah, it, does, it only has 9%. So you mm. take out half of the, the tub, okay? And put in real camphor and real eucalyptus and, you know, mix it around, a couple of plugs up your nose, a little bit in here in your voice box. Mm-hmm. Not only does it keep any kind of uh, airborne virus away from you, because nothing's going to go anywhere near that. Mm-hmm. It also gives you a good hallucinogenic experience and also a great night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it, with, it, with camphor. <laughs> and it's wow, it's, it's used on crime scenes. That's pretty... Um... <laughs> So there you are, boys and girls. Follow what your uncle Freddie says and take your camera regularly. But again, uh, Let don't me break that it. down. No, I'm kidding. I've used over. Vicks for for crime scenes. You, yeah, you have to put something up your nose. <laughs> exactly, and I mean it's it's all to do with keeping your respiratory system clean. Honey is very good for you as well, mm-hmm. and a little bit of cognac actually does help. You know, a bit of alcohol. And any respiratory illness like COVID, uh, it, it will stay away, believe me, unless your system is so degraded, in which mm. case you are susceptible, and we have to take care of people like that. But my belief is that you've got to build up your own immune system because the next virus, you will not survive this. Um, mm-hmm. Vaccine alone will not help us. We have to develop our own internal vaccine to build up a kind of a resistance and harmonize with it. 
Uh, and the, and uh, going back to the subject at hand, uh, in Egypt, we go to a, a visit a Nubian family. We were in Aswan, so we got to the Temple of Phila. We've got to see where they did the initiation under the Isis um, emblem. Uh, mm-hmm. That's where the whole uh, process began. You began your initiation in uh, uh, the Temple of Isis at Phila, and you go up the Nile, temple to temple, raising your body's electrical currents, and then the prize was the Great Pyramid, you see. This is, is this something I'm, I'm putting together right now. So this is a frequency thing all, then? Uh, yeah, each temple, uh, each of the original mounds of creation, and I've, mm-hmm. I've almost got all of them now. It's, they're hard to find. They're in very weird books, and I've almost nailed every single one of them. But you go from temple to temple, raising your frequency, and then the pyramid was the great prize. So after we've done filler, we go to the Nubian village, and uh, real people, and they're saying, well, they're so poor that they have sand on the floor. I said, no, they have sand on the floor because they're bloody smart. Because in the morning, when you see a little shallow uh, movement on the sand, you know there's a snake in the house. And ah. you grab the snake, and you take it to the young child, and you get the snake to bite the child. The child will take a fever for three days, but the poison starts to work with the immune system, and you will never suffer from snake poison ever again. And there's the rub, because if you can build your immune system, you should be able to overcome any virus. Wow. We are the temple, after all. That's tough love right there. <laughs> oh, <Absolutely. ouch. laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, by the way, we have to handle a live crocodile, and I'm, I'm serious about this. We actually handle the, the family pet alive, and I'm talking big crocodile. And even the girls like to hold him. Oh, our producer <laughs> likes to eat likes them. Likes to eat them, whatever. yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. We have, there. Way, we have way too much on my tools. We have way too much fun. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. We've got to hit one challenge. of those. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you can conquer your fear, and in the crocodile, you are an initiate. So there is a bit of a story to that. And, in fact, when you go up to the next temple, which is Komombo, the second in the series, uh, the initiate, to demonstrate that they had learned to conquer their fear, literally had to swim with a crocodile or actually plural, crocodiles, and the uh, symbol that showed that you definitely had overcome it was that you were able to put an earring on the crocodile's ear, and there's a museum next door full of stuffed crocodiles, or sorry, mummified crocodiles, and they had the earring still on. And so that's when you demonstrated, I have conquered my fear. So that's why that temple is dedicated to Sobek, the crocodile god. But there was a little trick to it, I found out. The priest used to give the... um, uh, they used to put a mild narcotic into the pool to the uh, crocodiles. Well, it made them a little less feisty. So you had no. one and a half minutes to get the earring on the uh, crocodile. So yeah. a bit of a twist. The point was still the same. So it works on crocs too. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self. Wow. Um, so what's next for you? I, I mean, you know, you're always doing events. You're writing books. You're you're uh, over at I'm Gaia's. Gonna... Yeah, I just sold another, well, I have released a, a new uh, documentary about Orion as the origin of the gods, which is on my website. Mm-hmm. Uh, that will eventually, eventually will come out on Gaia towards the end of the year. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you have a DVD player, that's where you get it. I um, ordered it. <laughs> well, it's, on, it's on Vimeo as well, if you want to uh, watch it on demand. But I'm working on another one, um, which I'll keep quiet about for the time being. And I'm starting a new book project now, uh, finally. And it, I might have to go and hang out in Donegal uh, because it's set in that particular part of the world. It's been something that's been brewing for a long time. Hard project again, but I want to make it fun. And uh, I think Donegal will be the right place to go looking for old gods who built some very unusual stone circles in Scotland, specifically in Orkney. So that gives you an idea what this is going to be about. But I, I friended the... Uh, an artist on Facebook, so it's actually useful for something. And uh, uh, she says she should be glad to show me around Donegal. I said, absolutely. I think I can hang oh, out. tough freaking break, Freddie. Really, <laughs> so hard. I that really life. feel bad yeah. for you. I go to Scotland for any reason. Yeah. I know. <laughs> tough break. The Guinness, the Guinness will be flowing, and the stories from the Irish people will be flowing. And yeah. uh, oh, you'll definitely have to put this in your book. I said, okay. How tall is the story? Oh, very tall. <laughs> I love the way they tell stories though I have a dear friend who's from Scotland and I just love hearing the stories 
<laughs> There's something to be said for oral history. The folklore has so much information. Yes. Um, but then yeah. you do get the credity old guys when uh, the island of Mal is one of my favorites. And you get on the ferry, you get off the ferry, and um, there's a tiny little, it's not a village shop. It's not even a village. It's not even a hamlet. It's just a shop with four houses. And you go in and you buy yourself a couple of packs of oat cakes, um, which uh, Strachan's oat cakes, because they're bloody thick. And they're like lamas bread. You have one, and you don't have to eat for the rest of the day. I'm sure that's where Tolkien got the idea from. So I'm stacking up on oat cakes, and um, uh, an, an old crudgety uh, Scottish guy uh, by the till says to me, did you just arrive on that big boat? And I said, what, the ferry? Yeah, I just came on the ferry. Why? Good. Then you'll be getting back on it later. All right. <laughs> Oh my God! Don't eat the haggis. That's all I gotta say. Don't eat the haggis. Oh my God! Forget the whole when in Rome thing. I had somebody try to say you should have some haggis. I don't think so. I just do yeah, not. Yeah, no, it, I'll pass. The Italians have something like that as well. I'll pass. It's called cotechino. It's like see you later. Oh, and no. black pudding made from blood pressed by hand from the carcass. Oh, our oh. breakfast in Scotland. I wonderful. was just going to say, but the even in England, the breakfast has and... the blood sausage, right? Oh, there's double fried egg, there's beans, there's fried bread. You're going to have fried that's bread oh, in lard. Oh, that would so be good. good. Yeah, oh, that's got to be fast. amazing. That is good. Yeah, and then, you know, by about one o'clock, you feel like you probably should go to the pub for lunch for a soup or something. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I would want to have fish or and chips in England. <laughs> <laughs> soup or a pint. <laughs> yeah. well, we have just a little bit of uh, a, a, a wee drum just to keep the cold out because we got, we got work in the afternoon. We have to I actually fall fall over. Out to get into the sacred cave and get this. This is the highlight of the Scotland tour uh, to keep it in. The, the concept of the resurrection. Um, I found a, a, a cave uh, on Mull where up to the 18th century, they were still using it for initiations. And oh. um, I get this, this is, this is the length to which these people went. So you have to rappel down the cliff uh, on your bum, and then you go through these, excuse me, these boulders, which are very slippery. Uh, and in fact, the first time I found it, I actually eviscerated the entire length of my arm. I fell backwards and completely scraped the, uh, the skin off my arm, but it was worth it uh, because I found the entrance to the cave and it's uh, on t uh, below the second oldest rocks on earth, which is incredible. The mm. view of the Atlantic, equinox sunset. So that's the mark of the, of the wow. initiation chamber. Mm -hmm. So they used to go into this cave, which looks like this massive dome of a cathedral. It's totally sensory deprivation. So you're going to the belly of a womb of a divine mother. And for 18.6 miles, you'd go under the island of Mull and you'd reappear on the other side of the islands to face the equinox sunrise. Wow. And the, the young maiden, and there's the symbol for you, you've married a divine bride. They actually went under the entire island for 18 and a half miles. Wow. That is incredible. You can still do about 400 feet because they, you know, the sea level's risen, the sand is now crushed mm -hmm. to the back of the, uh, uh, the tunnel, so you can't uh, get for it any further. But I've got an account from the 17th century that people were still going into the cave, and there's stuff that they describe, which you now you can't see. So obviously they were still going further inland. So this is the stuff that they used to do just to have this initiation experience so they could conquer the fear and come out completely enlightened. And... Uh, Mal, Iona, uh, that whole area has a whole uh, story and a folklore of people doing strange things to, again, have this incredible ability to be in control of their lives. Uh, so it's, it's everywhere if you just have to look for it. It's amazing that places like this even exist and the great lengths that the ancients went through just to give you that experience. Exactly. But you'll get 400 feet with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just be trying to hog the whole experience. Oh, the best part, the best part, the tide is coming in. <laughs> oh boy! So, I was just thinking that. Where, where the, the water tide wings? come in? Yeah. I, well, I, I have to calculate the tide and everything. And of course, I sit outside, making sure that uh, there's no exceptional high tide or anything. So right. I've got to, I keep an eye on things while people are out going out and doing their journey for at least two hours. 
Uh, and uh, all you can hear is your breath and your heart. And believe me, when all you can hear is your breath and your heart inside this massive room, uh, it, it hits you. It hits you very hard. It makes you very uncomfortable. But that's the whole point. The whole point is to suddenly discover who you really are. And people leave there a little bit groggy. And then we have a very big meal with uh, lots of uh, scotch afterwards because yeah. they've earned it. So, yeah. no, it's, it's a wonderful experience. It's still being done. But uh, there are other parts of that part of the world where things are still happening. Uh, there's the cave of Staffa, uh, which is actually you can see from the mouth of this uh, initiation cave. And they were doing something similar there as well. And they, there are three caves, and they're actually aligned to the first rising of the belt stars of Orion about 3,500 BC. So that's how old this, this initiation was going on in that part of the world. Wow. That's unbelievable. I, I mean, oh this goodness. goes back... I, I know it's no, it really is mind blowing because I, I love ancient history. But, um, like, as I know in the book, you mentioned at least 2500 BC, like, it goes really far back, very much so. Like, the initiation, um, yeah. Well, thank you for that research because, believe me, you know, just reading through that, I'm just like, I can't even imagine, but then, but then I can, but I'll just live through you because you've done it so. <laughs> I don't plan on traveling anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, you know, well, we we're we're can't. kind of locked down. Yeah. We're in lockdown. Yeah. yeah. Again. We can't even get across we the border. We never got out. You can't we even get across the border. You can't you can't cross the Canadian border. You can no. go to the border and say hi to the agents, but that's about it. If you yeah. fly in here, you have to quarantine for two weeks at a hotel, is it? No, three days. Three days? It's oh, they've changed $2,000. It? $2,000. Three, three, three days because yeah. you have to come back with two negative tests. You the New one Zealand and quarantine for, uh, for a lot less than that. Quarantine. That's what I, I said. I could go to your five-star hotel with that. that. I'd go to Cuba with that. No, no it's really, <laughs> just it, it's, it's yeah. just chaotic. So well, it's that's like, the one yeah. thing I don't really understand. This is why the whole thing is such a disaster. I mean, if you've taken a COVID test and you're, you know, you're negative, then you're fine. You don't need to quarantine. So mm -hmm. if you need to quarantine, the, the test is pointless. Or no. one of the other. Well, or they have no you're... idea what's going on. And I suspect yeah. that there's a lot of that. I, I think they're just, uh, based, well, governments are notoriously conservative. They don't like bad news. So if people start dying on their watch, they will do the most irrational things mm -hmm. in order to give a sense of uh, order. Uh, so there's no real conspiracy. I just don't think they know what the hell they're doing, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, because I mean, I went through London, and I hope I'm not breaking any rules by saying this, but when I go through London, I, I can't actually leave the airport. I have to go to a hotel. Well, uh, when they cancelled my flights, which they did, I had to get to go to another terminal. And you fill out a form saying where you're going to be. And I said, this is this form is actually quite redundant to cancel my flight. I've got to go over to Terminal 2. And they went, oh, okay, we trust you. I could have gone to see a play. I could have gone to the pub. I could have gone <laughs> walking. I mean, it was very <laughs> like a I found the whole thing very, uh, you know, just haphazard. Very relaxed. So I don't think they're taking it seriously as they probably should. But, yeah, and I wasn't lying. I really had to go to another mm. terminal. It's fine. But, uh and it was the same thing coming back into the States, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. You take the test in Egypt and you stop in, off in London and you'll say, I've got to get to the next terminal. So I went to a, a third terminal. I knew there's a coffee shop open there and a very good one. So mm -hmm. I actually lied and I went back to the original terminal. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <'cause> no <laughs> you just got eat. red flag. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, you know. I, I We're down. Made, Sorry, Joe. Uh, and, in fact, I was actually nowhere near anybody. I know the places to hang out in airports where nobody goes. I like to be left yeah. alone and quiet. And they yeah. even have reclining chairs. And then, um, yeah, you come into America, you got to go to a 14-day lockdown. Well, I just got onto a bus. I uh, got to a bus all the way to Maine. I got in my car and I went home. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the trick is not to lie about it. If you don't feel well, then obviously mm. don't infect other people. It's a bit like going to the office when you've got a cold. You know you've got to infect at least half mm -hmm. of the people. Uh, mm. The trick is not to lie about it. The trick is to take common precautions and common sense, and right. we'll get through this, you know. 
Right, right. No the one would think, but... helps, by the way. <laughs> some some people lack that, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yes, I've met a few of those. <laughs> Darn heathens. If you, have, <laughs> if you have to be reminded to wash your hands, there's a problem. There's a problem. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but, oh. a little bit of a, just but a, as just always, a tiny bit of a problem. We'll get there. It'll, all things, all this will pass, and I wouldn't worry. I mean, I personally, I'm more concerned about what uh, NASA and the mathematicians are concerned about between 2030 and uh, 2042, uh, and about large chunks of rock which have a very good chance of hitting the Earth. I'd be more concerned about that right now. I would think so. Yeah, there's a lot going on. That's for sure. It's hard to keep up with it all. You know, and like this whole great reset. I'm like, what is that exactly? <laughs> this great yeah, reset. Where are you going with this? <laughs> May you live in interesting times. Um, yes. Okay. But here's the thing: we chose to be here. I mean, if you if you follow the big picture, uh, and again, this actually goes back to initiation as well. Uh, one of the things that you do learn is your position in the bigger scheme of things and how things actually work, which is why you know Pythagoras wanted to do it five times. And one of the things that you learn is that you choose to be here at certain times. You incarnate with certain people to achieve mm-hmm. certain things, and yeah. you don't have to believe that. But if you can accept that. 80% of the burden that you're carrying around right now will vanish inst- instantaneously because you've taken responsibility for being here. Mm-hmm. The paradox is you don't know why you're here. And you spend all your life watching shows, podcasts, reading books, going watching Gaia, going into conferences to find out <laughs> what you're doing here. The trick is to be aware enough. You don't need that much to make you aware. You just need the right things to make you aware. Mm-hmm. And the quicker you become Wait, the more you realize that, ah, okay, I, I'm actually here for a reason, which I don't know until I die. But mm-hmm. the best, if I can handle myself the best I can and not beat myself with a stick too hard if I don't get it right, because if we were that good at it, we wouldn't have bothered to incarnate. Okay, think about it. If yeah. we were supposed to be that godly, we wouldn't be here. We'd be helping someone else on planet Earth mm-hmm. going for that. So we're not perfect. We're here to perfect ourselves. And the trick is not to beat yourself about it and recognize that there is a purpose and you're here to learn something. And sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easy. The trick is to always walk upright and learn that when you fall down, you pick yourself back up and they'll make a habit of falling down. Mm-hmm. And that's all there is to do, uh, there is to learn. And if you can help others along the way, that's all you need to do. And believe me, it makes life much more easy. And, uh, and I mean, I used to be the same way. I used to fret about things a lot. And uh, so when I write, I really write from experience that I've also helped myself become a better person, I hope. Uh, Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've watched myself grow and take control of my life and realize that actually I am in control. I shouldn't be reacting to all of this. I can blink at the things that I allow into my life. And it's the one thing I'll teach people when we go on tour. Don't go on your cell phone. Don't go on your iPads, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. <laughs> because you, you're tethered to all this noise. And unless you have business to do, and that's cool. But believe me, when you come back to the airport 10 days later and you are hit with this noise and this amount of media and everything and friend mm-hmm. requests, you realize that you could actually define how much you allow into your life because for the last nine days, you've been having a hell of a great time on the same planet. And right. for nine days, you weren't even aware that there was a virus, that there are problems, that you have bills to pay. And where were you? You were in a state of bliss. You were happy. So we can, we can define our temple and allow what needs to be allowed in to give ourselves a bit of breathing room. And mm-hmm. that's what gives you control in your daily life. So it's the best advice I've been given, and I try to practice it. It certainly works for me. So, you know, anytime mm-hmm. anyone this is on Facebook, just click delete. You don't have to react. And it makes you feel so it's like killing someone without, and they're still living, you know. Oh, the delete button, it's like you're playing God. It's like I've just deleted them. They don't exist anymore, and I haven't hurt them at all. And it mm-hmm. makes you feel good. It's like a punching bag, but no one actually gets hurt. <laughs> And I suggest you I try hit, that. I hit, well, I hit block yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah, someone says something yeah. really uh, stupid and uh, unreasonable, just hit delete. You know, why waste your time? I don't know. I see the kissy face first, though. You don't even know who they are. Yeah, kissy face first. Michelle's a little bit smoother than I am. She's the nicer one out of the two of us. Yeah, I'm pretty volatile most of the time. I don't even know you. (laughs) 
Like, why am I, why do I care what you think? That's the first thing that goes through my head. Why do I even care? Why am I entertaining this? Why is it taking time out of my life? We're the last generation that grew up without a cell phone it's as true. teens. We're the last generation. We should, you know, cherish that and teach the next one how to find balance. Exactly. I mean, I got people sort of phoning me from outside the street. I said, where are you? I'm outside. Well, they just ring the bell and come in and talk to me first. Like, <laughs> oh. Uh, well, the know, best one is when you're texting somebody away, upstairs. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, yeah but sadly, text, that's the only way you can reach my daughter. Yeah, yes, is by text texting her. Yeah, I know. I just pick I... up the phone and say, uh, come over for dinner. I've got something to tell you. Oh, I have slides from my last trip. And uh, we have a big meal, four courses, candles. It's all very medieval here. Oh, um, and nice. I love that. Me too. No, <laughs> we'll leave legless and uh, with dessert and all that kind of stuff. I've uh, but seen that's, you post cakes. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, because I love to cook. I'm like, wait a second. There's another side to Freddie that I love here. But yeah, I love cooking. Cake. I find it therapeutic <laughs> and meditative. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, sharing food with friends. I mean, there's nothing greater than that. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. like having a medieval banquet hall without all the jousting and the death. Uh, and the, yeah, <laughs> oh, come on. All that bloody, yeah. all that blood. Meat <laughs> stewed for three hours in Guinness, oh. you know, rhubarb and oh, uh, see, that's nuts. Good. And, uh, Steak in Guinness. Uh, well, big potato, yeah, lots of new potatoes, gravy, mm. good oh. bread, good wine. <laughs> yeah. Everybody brings something, and you make it. It could be like Thanksgiving. When's you know, the border everything. opening? <laughs> I know. I just when? Show up. I'm just gonna show up. <laughs> oh my God! Is dinner for It would be <laughs> nice to have someone else cook for once. Oh, when yeah. I've made a, made cake. I, I'm a notorious cake maker, and uh, they know that I've made cake, and I get all these emails that, um, "Are you available for for coffee this afternoon?" Is it, Okay, come on over. It's still warm. It's just come out of the house. You know I made cake, didn't you? Don't you? Smell you it. Oh, you got did you cake. post it? You've got to have cake. That's oh, you're yeah. tuned in. <laughs> you know? Oh, oh. You have to have everything. Oh, oh, unbelievable. In fact, I'm going to make one tomorrow. I'm going to take it for a friend of mine for dinner. Oh, look at that. It's, <laughs> it's like alchemy and therapy in one, you know? Uh, cooking is actually <laughs> very, very good. In fact, the Dalai right. Lama agrees with me on this. Have you, have you read his 49 affirmations? No. So he has 49 affirmations, and they're all very serious and very Buddhist, as you'd expect from the Dalai Lama. And um, the, and then you're going, oh, yeah, okay, uh, love thy neighbor, don't do this, do that, blah, 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 oh, wonderful. And the 49th, approach cooking and love with reckless abandon. I thought, he's got it absolutely right. Love it. This that's, man that's understands mine. me. I know. That's mine. So, no, I, I can cook for anybody. Cook. Oh, I love to cook. That'd be great to go and hang out with the Dalai Lama in his kitchen. Oh, I would my love gosh. to cook for him. Something tells me the Dalai Lama doesn't really do much cooking. <laughs> so, I don't know why. I've got to think he's much more normal than we, uh, we give him credit for. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't know. He said, have you read this? No, I don't like him as much as you. I mean, I like him. <laughs> I just don't know if he can hold my interest the same way, <laughs> even if he is yeah. the Dalai Lama. <laughs> We're spiritual people and normal people. Uh, yeah. Like uh, Mother Teresa, totally normal. Mm. I mean, I couldn't do what she did. I mean, what an incredible uh, human being. Uh, Audrey Hepburn. I someone who knew Mother Teresa. Oh, really? And, yeah, he, um, he owned... A company in India, and they made all the soles for the shoes for the wow. people of India. And he did charity work, and he would meet with her, and they would, you know, get clothing, and they would collect everything, and he would, you know, find help to finance some of that, and they would go through some of the more impoverished areas. So we got a little bit of insight on her, her life from somebody who knew her. Yeah, 16. yeah. I just really nice. Documentary on Audrey Hepburn as well. I, I always admired her for a lot of reasons, but she was a wonderful humanitarian, and hardly anyone knew what she did for UNICEF. Mm -hmm. uh, a great ambassador, uh, mm -hmm. wonderful human being, and she went through a lot of uh, stuff during the war. So, and she mm -hmm. uh, was someone who always in need of love, and yet she was always giving and always happy. She's she's had this magnetic presence about her, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, wonderful mm -hmm. human being. So, well, mm -hmm. yeah, like you have to give back. I think, exactly. you know, um, well, it's kind of like hoping even, you know, with the show, it's kind of, oh, it's a platform for a lot of, 
you know, for a lot of people such as yourself. I have, you know, people say, this is very important that you do this. And we must be doing something, right? Because we were nominated for People's Choice Award. And I'm thinking, that's not bad for just a show that's just about 18 to 20 months old. So, you know, here we are. People's yeah. Choice Award, Alas. Thank you. Thank you. you can have an extra sip for me right there. That's perfect. <laughs> I've got water on my table. Actually, but anyway. This is actually a very good test uh, to find out if you have COVID because apparently you lose your taste of smell and taste. So, <laughs> no, I can still smell it. I'm just going to taste it. <laughs> the no, I can taste it. I'm going to try this every minute until I, just to make sure. Try every that day, at every, the border. Every try that at day. the border. <laughs> <laughs> you may yeah, have to share that. you may have yeah. to share and you might get across canadians are friendly <laughs> very uh, I don't know what that goes. <laughs> oh my god that's hilarious but we we are at 11 even though we got started late and thank you for <laughs> indulging us and uh, hanging out with us for a little longer and uh it was a lot of fun it's always a lot of fun Did so we get to talk about anything that we're supposed to talk about i'm pretty sure we covered lots of ground <laughs> <laughs> which is great but maybe once you 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 know start working on another project we can have you back and uh oh, we well, you. Okay. you can hang out with us chickies it's all right we'll let you have cognac uh, well okay well, the water's open I'm, I'm, not, I'm only about five hours from canada so oh. That goes by really fast with the right company if you're driving. Well, obviously. actually, in the Mini Cooper, it's about half an hour. Half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Those little guys go. That's yeah, for sure. I'll be, I, had the, I had to go to the printer today in Massachusetts, and uh, I dare say I was hitting 92. It was <laughs> great fun. <laughs> <laughs> You're just reckless. The police can't I love Massachusetts. Well, it's the truth is you, find a, you find what they call a volunteer to go ahead of you, and then you give them a quarter <laughs> of a mile, and then you go boom, and then you've got yeah. little blue lights, and you go, okay, I'll just turn, go into the middle lane now and disappear. Okay. I know. Those yeah. cars make me behave very badly. Uh, I have a sports car that's very, very fast. It's about 630 horsepower. So neither is uh, it's a Mercedes CL. It's a, it's a 500 uh -oh. AMG. Yeah, uh -oh. it comes out in the uh -oh. summer. So, someone makes you living. <laughs> Her name is Lilith, actually. <laughs> with, with, the, uh, with the gal doors? No, no, not that one. <laughs> Oh, wow. It would yeah, be a little difficult in the parking lot. Everybody's every man for himself here. People with senses of humor. I've seen people pull real close to people with doors like that. It's like, I don't want to oh, be that guy. No. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah cross. <laughs> yeah, but, for the 1956 Gullwing. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. Our yeah. Mercedes dealer, not too far from here, they've got one that's on display all the time. Oh. I know oh, you just it's beautiful it's not even for sale it's on display like it must belong to the owner and it's just there for people to just you know Probably drool all over it you're not even allowed to point a bit you're not even allowed to think of considering a point either. exactly do not cross the, the line house, the house <laughs> on wheels in Canada yeah no, oh. I know they're, they're beautiful beautiful cars no I anyway. know it's they are faster the better on that, on, on that note <laughs> <laughs> it's time for another cognac but you know thank you for joining us and and again you know i'm going to keep tabs on what you're doing i do follow along and i would you know be pleased if you would consider coming and hanging out with us again and uh yeah i suppose i'll let you know when the next project's finished uh, yes. it's, uh <laughs> just getting cracked up now but we could just I mean, bring you on to do this this is something that's prehistory of Ireland that gives me a headache i mean what a nightmare yeah, we can do a cooking show if it, if it works. The, un the unspellables. It's uh, and then no one knows what the real history is, which sounds very Irish, of course, or right. where it began. And I have to sit down unraveling all of this. It's uh, but it's going to be an interesting story. It's uh, it'll, it's going to end up in a place we would not expect, and I didn't expect it either. I just have to learn a dead language. That's all. Oh, uh, nothing, that all. Yeah, that nothing, I nothing for you. Language. Simple little that task. Is... <laughs> I'm I'm positive you're gonna you're gonna just do so great with that. I I'm not worried. It's gonna be You'll be back here. 
Yeah. Well, maybe we just should have fed you extra cognac, and maybe then you would have just kind of let it spill out a little bit. <laughs> 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 that next it's still a dead language, it's actually cognac. <laughs> you know, like the, like the first date, right? So, just so with, was I thinking with... out loud? Oh, my God. <laughs> what, was, what was that language that Tolkien created just for Lord of the Rings? There was a certain word for it. Oh. Elvish. Exactly. Elvish. Elvish. I love it. Elvish. I love it. People El -El actually, that's another El series I have. Yeah. Seen. <laughs> no, but people actually tried to learn that. It was hilarious just seeing people trying to create a whole thing around it. I'm El just like, uh, I know. It's, it's a whole, just left the building. A whole movement. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> whole movement. You know how many people are out there trying to find Middle Earth? <laughs> exactly. All right, ladies. Uh, thank you Always so much. Thank you. <laughs> Always a have pleasure. a good night. Thank you, Fred. It's an honor. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Well, that was fun. That's always fun. Freddie's always fun. He's just a hoot, <laughs> you know. And he was so gracious with his time, you know. Very. Uh, with Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of people in the chat room, and I'm, I'm hoping you guys all enjoyed the show also. Um, we are over the 11 mark. We did get started a little bit late because a little bit of trouble uh, in New Orleans, you know, just like a hurricane warning. <laughs> Nothing too serious. <laughs> Good oh, grief. But we have come to another, you know, awesome uh, the end of another awesome segment here on the Outer Realm. And huge thank you to Freddie Silva for uh, hanging out a little longer than usual. Uh, big, big, big thank you to Folgers Coffee for partially sponsoring tonight's show. Uh, remember to stop by United Public Radio Network and the UFO Paranormal Radio Network YouTube channel. Subscribe. Um, get some double the fun going on. And uh, if you want to see a certain guest or topic, please message us at the outer realm contact at gmail.com. Again, the outer realm contact at gmail.com. Tune in next week for Wednesday night. We'll have Jason Hewlett joining us talking about his journey into the paranormal. And Thursday we have the amazing Rick, Nick Redfern, blah, 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 say that three times. And uh, of course he's going to wow us more of his research also. So great lineup. In the meantime, Amelia and I thank you. Have a good night and have a basically fantastic safe weekend. So good night.